Tyler, if you step in just a little bit more, that's good, like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, you want me in the right position right here. Very good. And we are live. Okay. Would you introduce yourself, please? I will. Um, actually, before I do that, this is a course tonight on combustion analysis and troubleshooting. My name is Tyler Nelson. Well, before we get to that, actually, if anybody here has served or is in active service, Thank you very much for your service. I want you know, on behalf of Southern Americas, we appreciate your service. That's most important. And then lesser importance is my credential here. My name is Tyler Nelson. I am the instrumentation and industrial sales manager for Sourman. I come from close to now 27 years of experience in the industry. Proudly hold my master HVACR designation, an eight instructor, BPI instructor, and I'm a global speaker for combustion and also refrigeration. That is my cell phone contact there. That is my email contact there as well. A little bit on the Saruman Group, who are we? Well, we come from over 45 years of experience in our industry in the design and manufacturing of instrumentation. We make combustion analyzers, which is part of the purpose of our conversation tonight, and I'll talk about the analyzers at the end. But we also make refrigeration manifolds, IAQ monitors, um, other instrumentation for our industry, such as hygrometers, manometers, we also make emissions analyzers, so I'm in oil fields testing as well. Um, but the main crux of this slide, and what I want you to pull from this, is the fact that we design tools with you in mind, with a technician in mind. These are designed by techs for techs. So everything you're going to see with any instrumentation you use from us should have a lot of logic behind it, which should really have no Achilles heels. And hopefully you're going to see that if you wind up using our analyzers as we go forward. And we are... In this traceable lab company, we are available in over 65 countries, and our calibration lab for the Americas is in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, not far from you folks. So what are we going to go over tonight? We're going to go over why you're here. I know your parents have always told you why you're here, and I think that's very sweet and very cute. My version is a little bit different. We're going to go over cross-contamination verification with an analyzer, seven functions of highly effective analyzers, CO safety, we're going to talk about gas pressure, we're going to talk about how to test, why to test, where to test, the importance of all this, and some commissioning, diagnosing, and maintaining modalities as well. Before we do, it's time to make the invisible visible. With a lot of this, if you've never done combustion before, it seems very abstract. And even if you're doing it, you might not be aware of the finer nuances that are involved in this that can actually take your skill set to the next level. The greatest compliment that someone like myself can get with a product like this is that it's like having a second technician with you. And I think for those of you that have used the product, whether it's mine or even somebody else's, can verify the fact that it's pretty important. But again, there are attributes and finer nuances of this, like I mentioned, that I'm going to go over here that will hopefully bring it more into the fore. Because you understand this just a little bit better than before you walked in the door. Because I think when a lot of you walked in, you thought it was for a CO, O2, and CO2, and that's it. That is only the jumping off point. That is not where it ends. All right. So, he doesn't exist. And if he did, that would be a little bit weird. And he also doesn't like me. You look at his nice ears here. They look like elf ears, which he doesn't like the fact that I pointed that out either. Um, but there is no combustion fairy. So, since there is no combustion fairy, we have to be the ones that actually take the time to test. And then we're seeing things like this out there, right? This is pretty creative. Exhaust and intake going into the same conduit, right? Not a good idea, right? Not what we're going to see. But it gets better. Huh. Okay. We look closely here. What do we see? Blue gases piped into the supply trunk. Not a very good idea, right? What? Exactly. Not a very good idea. And that was in your state of Ohio. Uh, this is low-income housing. This was a DIYer. This was a contractor, right? This is the kind of stuff that's going on out there. These are the kind of people that do not attend a class like this that are actually running amok. These are the situations that you're going to inherit out in the field that you're not even aware of, okay? Here, a few more things for you. I guess our venting looks good here, right? So we're so adept at cutting a hole in the door, so that the intake and the exhaust. You're like a surgeon now, right? Why don't we cut a hole in the bottom and run a condensate? Well, you're right. I mean, you're that good, right? And heaven forbid you needed any transitions, you're not going to get them because it's crazy. Some of a bitch is taking them all on you. You're not going to get those. And if you're looking to add heat to the children's playroom, mm. let's cut it into the clothes. Mm. Awesome. That's, that's the best way to do it, right? That's the best way, right? And also, 100%. if you're not, right, exactly, it's 100% or killing somebody is what that is. 
And if you wanted any more creative usage for gutter leader, I expect it to be a run at Home Depot or Lowe's after this. I want you boys to buy all that stuff up. Oh, okay? like Look at all that. <laughs> and this was somebody's version of creating a high, a condensing system, a high efficiency system, excuse me, out of an atmospheric system by running the exhaust outside and putting a supply register on it. And they didn't even have enough screws, so they have to keep it held in place with a rock. So this is the shoddy craftsmanship that is taking place because people don't care. <laughs> We have a training void in this industry. Okay. You're here because you have you're filling that void and you're here because you're knowledge based. You know, and I appreciate the folks at RICS having me out tonight. Very, very nice. So why are we here? And why are you here? Well, it's part revolution and it's part evolution. The revolution side of this is on the side of equipment manufacturers. Warranty claims for our industry for equipment that we return that we think is defective is at the rate of 30 to 40 percent in our country. Outside of the United States. It is only three to four percent. Why is that? That is because outside of our country, combustion analysis is predominantly mandatory, which means you have to do it usually a minimum of once per year, some pockets of the world twice per year, and in some pockets of the world, equipment gets replaced every 10 years. What is happening, and the reason that this is taking place, is that most of those other countries get their fuel from mm -hmm. you know, Pretty interesting in the times that we're in today, that we're also seeing that play out in form. I've been talking about this for years, as well as my other colleagues have discussed it as well, and my mentors. Okay, so that's part of the issue. So what's happening, though, is that these processes are being done like this, and the way that the reason they're doing combustion on a continuous basis is because if they did not do it, their economies of scale would crumble. They have to keep their hands wrapped around every combustion process that they employ. That's why you see a lot of diesel fuel. So what's happening is that success leaves clues here. Because since it's mandatory, you have the equipment being commissioned correctly, maintained correctly, and diagnosed correctly. Those three touches drive warranty claims down through the floor. There's something magical that happens when we get out of the paradigm of thinking that these things are plug and play, and we actually use an analyzer to commission a system. It's pretty, pretty interesting what happens. You set it up for success instead of leaving it to be questionable, possibly having a shortened surface life if you don't use an analyzer to set it up. Okay. So we have a revolution on the side of equipment manufacturers. They can't make that governmental regulation here. So what they started to do, putting in the manuals, companies like Cleaver Brooks, Triangle Tube, some Navion that are doing it, that are making it mandatory for your customer to get their warranty, you have to submit the combustion analysis to that. Okay? Mm. Other manufacturers are thinking of doing the exact same thing, and that's in process right now. You couple that with the fact that we have certain municipalities around this country making it mandatory that you do combustion analysis as well in certain states as well. That's starting to happen. You take those two things, those two revolutions, that has elicited an evolution of the way that we practice. Our jobs are no longer business as usual. We have to take the time to test. And again, they're giving you targets here for CO2 and O2, okay? All the targets are here for you. It's in manufacturer's example. This is a lock in of our boiler. Then we have test ports. Look, these are not facing trouble knobs, right? Contrary to popular belief. Not there either in this concentric package. But if we don't see them, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean we shy away and we don't test, right? No, we don't go, oh, I can't do it. No, 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 no. Take your drill, create your access hole, pack cap with a brass cap when you're done, three eighths, call it a day. You're still going to test. You're not going to shy away from it. And for those of you that are not aware, PVC in our industry is going away as a means of exhaust vent. In the state of Massachusetts, as of <laughs> August 31st, in, August 31st, 2021, no PVC used for exhaust venting. You encounter it, it's a red tag situation. Fire bureaus in New York, it's been that way for years. Parts of California, California, parts of Utah, same way. Outside of our country, PVC is never used for exhaust venting. We're the only state or the only country that does it. We used to think it was just the temperature tolerances that it couldn't handle. It's not the case. It's part of it, it's not the case. The real crux of it are the flue gases that are passing through it. The flue gases passing through the PVC is drying out the chloride properties and the polyvinyl chloride makeup, which is causing it to dry and rot out from the inside out. If you cut into PVC that is used for condensate purposes, it cuts and feels it just like PVC. You cut into PVC that is used for exhaust purposes, three, four, five years into its life cycle, it'll splinter, it'll crack, it becomes very, very brittle. And I'm sure you've all encountered that. And also, Take into consideration, we're not possibly giving enough cure time for these seams and this PVC glue. 
You look at the instructions on your PVC glue, it says typically 12 to 18 hour cure time. Are you giving things eight? Show of hands. Are you giving things 12 to 18 hours to cure? Exactly. Everybody has little T-Rex hands right now going like this. Uh, no. Ah. Right? We're not. I never did. I got blood on my hands for the same thing that you do. Okay? So, you have that issue where these aren't curing. Potential flu gas is coming out. Outside of Colorado Springs, a family of four went to the hospital. The husband or the father of the family is permanently, permanently neurologically impaired. The installers never glued the PVC. His office was adjacent to that area. They wound up suing the contractor, suing the technicians that were there, suing all the inspectors. Township got rid of all the inspectors, brought in all new inspectors. And now every time you install a fuel fire appliance or replace one, fresh and new, or replace one, I should say, a combustion analysis must be submitted for you to get final approval on your install. Okay. So they're starting to take this very seriously. Um, and so what we have now, though, <clears throat> is we have companies like Centro Thermo Durabent making polypropylene piping. That is meant for the temperature tolerances we're going to subject it to. So it's not going to be worn down. It is meant to resist the flue gases passing through it. So that's not going to be an issue. And they make gasket fittings. So there's no longer a need for PVC glue and there's no longer a need for cure times. So it's a very, very strong solution to this issue that we're so having. So this is a 90 plus. Yes. Yeah. Plus, what Plus. Is, <laughs> right. what's the vent material going to be? It's polypropylene that they're using now. Oh, okay. they want to put the ocean. Yeah. And, and if anybody is looking to yeah. go to jail for manslaughter, I'm uh -huh. to hopefully detract you from doing that or convince you not to do that because you do not install things like this with your fresh air and your exhaust going into the same conduit. That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. This is what's happening. This is why a lot of the classes that you will take at an equipment manufacturer are going to have some semblance of venting incorporated into those classes. Okay. So anyway, that's what's happening. So what do we have here? So with analyzers, right? Again, we all know they do O2, CO, and CO2. But they're more important than that, at least in my eyes they are. They do combustion analysis, yes. They do ambient CO, ambient temperature, draft, they do gas pressure. This is a pressure manometer built in here. You can verify cross, can uh, verify, excuse me, crack heat change or test with one on a course air system. And you can verify cross contamination when you're venting a condensing system. Okay. Outside of that, it is, there are very valuable commissioning, diagnostic, and maintenance attributes of it that make it a much more useful tool. What do you mean cross contamination? What are the, the more than one thing? I'm going to get to that. No, it's a good question. I'm going to get to that. You'll see. You'll see, and you'll, you'll, you'll find out that once I go through that, that there's a really strong use for an analyzer in that case. So combustion, before I get into what it is, here's how I want you to see it. So I want you to look at this as your annual physical at your doctor. So say, for example, you have 5% body fat, look like a cover model, you're ripped, you're checked, whatever you want to say in your own brains, right? You go to the doctor, the doctor looks at you across the counter and goes, I don't even think you need to be here. We're not going to make you go back and do a physical. Just pay your copay. We'll see you next year. And whatever you're doing, it's working. So don't change a thing. No, you could have cancer, leukemia, high blood pressure, a blockage, anything going on in your system that you're not aware of. And until that doctor does the blood work on you, he or she cannot ascertain the state of your health. There is no clue how you're functioning. Because what's the first thing the doctor says to you when you go in for a physical and you say, Doc, I don't feel well. I got this wrong. I got that wrong. What's the first thing you do? I'm going to write you a script. You got to go to lab court, get blood work done. Oh, God, Jesus. All right. But that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do because they cannot tell how you're how the state of your health until they do that. Now, they can do your blood pressure, which is akin to doing gas pressure on the system. They can do that for you, but until they get under the hood, and what they do is they make that invisible, now invisible, then they can get the state of your health because what are they doing for you? They are trying to make sure there is no shortening in the duration of your life or changing in the trajectory of your life. If they could solve something now before it festers and gets worse. That's what you're doing when you're doing combustion. You're doing the blood work on that system. You're preventing a catastrophic failure in that system. But what you're also doing in today's marketplace, because we can no longer just tell a customer something, right? There are some salty beards outside of mine in this room. The salty bearded gentleman can tell the younger gentleman in here that back in the day, I sound like the old get off my lawn guy. Back in the day, you can tell somebody, this is what you need to do. And they will follow you and lock stuff and say, okay, here's my deposit. Here's this. Go ahead and do it. Now you can't do that. Now you have to prove your existence and justify what you're doing. 
Because the first thing they're going to do is after you give them a price on something, they're going to Google it and go, six eighty for this? The part's seventeen dollars. Right? Uh -huh. We've been there, right? We've been there. Because that's what they're doing. So with with this now, when you're doing combustion, especially with advanced analyzers that give you better diagnostics and better reporting, you can actually prove to a customer what they need to do and why. Because an analyzer is going to do one of two things for you. It's either going to give you a neon sign that says replace this or repair this, or it's going to give you a series of breadcrumbs that is going to sprinkle down for you that lead you to the path of doing that appropriate or that correct repair. So what is combustion? It is a collision sport. It's like football. We're in football season. You're taking three things that you're going to collide together. A fuel source, such as natural gas, oxygen, and heat or spark. When we collide those three things together, it produces rapid oxidation. The goal of that rapid oxidation is to create as much or derive as much energy from the burning of those fuels as absolutely possible. But unless we're measuring, we have no idea what we're burning, how we're burning, and why we're burning. Okay? If you look at this, for example, when we talk about the blood work, high CO in a system is akin to high cholesterol in a body. But you wouldn't know it because you're not analyzing it. Okay? This tagline here across the bottom that says the best test while the rest guess, that was given to me by the biggest contractor in my state of New Jersey, one of the biggest contractors in the country called Air Group. Okay? They have this tagline in different parts of their company. It is for them to use as a reminder for their technicians that they must test when they do any kind of visit. I do training there two to three days at, at a clip a couple of times a year. Okay? They take their combustion very, very seriously, and they're a class-leading company. As a matter of fact, one of the best I've literally ever seen. Okay. So we have three types of combustion. First is stoichiometric. Stoichiometric is a lab condition. It does not exist. It does not exist for two reasons. One primary, one secondary. Primary is it assumes that we have 100% oxygen in the air that we breathe. We do not. We have 20.9. The other 78% of that is nitrogen. The other 1% of that is typically argon gas. Okay. The secondary reason why we cannot have stoichiometric is that we have thermal loss or heat loss with any combustion process that we employ. So we cannot have stoichiometric. So what are we then left with? Two other types. We're left with incomplete, which is where we hover when we're not measuring, and then we have complete or good combustion, okay? Incomplete is where we're at, again, when we're not measuring, we're producing very, very dangerous conditions, such as high CO, um, sooty conditions, uh, inadequate air supply, and things of that nature. The manufacturers, though, want us to be here because they design a system and tune it to be set here, which is good combustion. That is the best fuel to air ratio. Well, we are ensuring two things. One, that all the hydrogen compounds are used up. Two, all the carbon compounds are used up. So we have all the useful fuel being used for combustion in proper fashion. And we have three things that we're enhancing. Service life, efficiency, and safety. And those are the three goals that we're going after when we're doing combustion. So what does it look like? I'm not going to belabor the perfect. I want to get to the incomplete. I know I'm going to step out of camera here for a second, but I don't want to block your view of everything. Every, you know, I want you to be able to see some of this still. Um, so what do we have here? We have an example where we are a methane molecule here, right? Mm -hmm. So your torso is a carbon and your arms and legs are hydrogen. And because I'm an evil person, I'm going to cut your arms and legs off. I'm going to throw you into the combustion process. And when I do, the way that you're going to stay alive as an isolated carbon is to attract two oxygens to yourself to become CO2, carbon dioxide. You're going to want to make the jump from being a carbon, not becoming CO, but becoming carbon dioxide. Okay. So you want to attract two oxygens to yourself. But there are other versions of you that I've done the same thing too. Right. But there's only so much oxygen to go around because remember, we're not measuring yet. We're talking about incomplete. We're talking about not taking the time to measure. So we don't know what we're producing, nor do we know how much oxygen, or in this case, excess air that we have. So some of you will produce CO2 in the quantities that you want. Some of you will not. So if I'm not producing carbon dioxide, what am I producing? Carbon monoxide. Exactly, carbon monoxide. That's something we don't want. So what we have here on the right side of the ledger, I'm going to step back for a second. We have such things as CO, carbon monoxide, that we don't want in high concentrations. We have CH4, so we have hot fuel going up a hot stack. Last time I checked, we don't want that. We have high temperatures and we have smoke. So we have challenges there. But we smarten up and we actually do combustion. It's the same example. If you're the same methane molecule, I do the same thing to you. 
check them out of the combustion process. But now the game has changed because now we have an analyzer hooked up. We make slight adjustments to a system. We increase the amount of excess air to the appropriate levels. What have we done? We now have a system that is safer, more efficient, and has potentially longer service life. But in doing so, we have cleaned up our flue gases. So now all we have CO2, water, heat, and oxygen, and that is it. Those are prior products that we do want to have. We've eliminated the things that we don't want, okay? Because the manufacturers have designed a system to run efficiently and effectively. This is where they want you to reside. Excess air. We have inconsistencies in fuel flow rates, okay? One of the things that we've not done enough in our country here is as we've done all this construction and as everybody's doing all this renovation, we have not enhanced the infrastructure to deliver fuel to properties like we should. And then we have contractors that are doing work in properties and not pulling permits. So we have fuel that is being used to fuel additions and other things in properties where we're changing the, the fuel flow rate. Because of that, we're having some challenges. So we need to dial in a system and potentially bring in a little bit of excess air. Also, obviously, verify gas pressure. Because without enough excess air, we have the formation of unwanted byproducts, such as CO, soot. We also have fuel losses. But if we have too much of it, we are have wasting of the fuel, cooling of the flame, and things of that nature. So if we look here, this is where the manufacturers want us to sit. This is that highest efficiency level, okay? This is where oxygen is proper, CO, and CO2 are correct, okay? So this is why excess air is important, <coughs> because it enables you to dial in a system to strike that delicate balance, okay? One thing I want to show you, direct O2 versus CO2. There are other experts that teach this topic that will tell you, lead you down a path that CO2 is king, that carbon dioxide is king. Is it important? Yes. Is it king? No. Oxygen is king in here as well. When we talk about this, if we just talk about CO2, this is a bell curve. So CO2 is the same here on the average side of the equation where happiness lives as it is over here on the fewer side of the equation which is on the fuel side of, the, of, of things where naughtiness lives or unhappiness lives, okay? So say we negated everything else. We said, you know what? Forget it. We're just going to focus on CO2. Boom. CO2, 10%, right? Say, for example, 10% here. Look at this CO. That's at a level that will kill somebody. That will kill you. That will kill the occupants. That will kill you. But you know what? We're doing it right. No, you're not. This is why oxygen is king. If you dial in your oxygen first, your CO is going to fall into check. And your CO2 is still going to be that same 10%. But what's happened is that when you dial in oxygen, the other players fall into place almost like a magnetic puzzle pieces. Okay. So you lead and end with oxygen. It begins and ends there. Okay. So when you're dialing the system, just something that I wanted to point out. Show of hands in the room. I'm not asking you to bait you. Anybody in here wear a personal CO monitor and they work? One. I like all of you, I care about all of you. We have in our industry, the highest rate of dementia and Alzheimer's that includes all the service industries. The average working life, not life, but working life expectancy of a technician in our field, 56 years of age now. It's not because you can't get yourself in and out of an attic or in and out of a crawl space or in and out of a scuttle hole, whatever the case may be. That is not the case. What's happening is that you're losing your cognitive ability, but you don't even know it. You think you're losing something off your fastball, you think the, the technology is overmatching you. No, it's not. Because whether or not you know it or realize it, your default is that you fix things for a living. Wow. Trust me, you can do anything. If you can fix things for a living, you can do anything. You're not overmatched. Your cognitive ability declines because CO has its hooks in you because you're not even aware of it. Okay? It's one of the functions of an analyzer, however. Well, we can actually monitor the ambient environment for carbon monoxide with a combustion analyzer. Okay? Now... I just did a major faux pas, which I will tell you. I just turned this on inside here. This is the this comes down to don't do as I do, do as I say, please. When the current protocol for this is for you to turn this on outside in fresh air with no probes or hoses attached. Why? When you turn it on outside in fresh air, it is not warming up for you. It is zeroing itself out, which means it's going to show you 20.9% oxygen. It's going to show you everything else can be zero. Zero CO2, zero CO, and on and on down the line. The reason why I don't want any probes or hoses attached yet is because I don't want you to run the risk 
of pulling the remnants of a previous combustion test from this probe and hose assembly into the analyzer and then selling the startup protocol, okay? So say, for example, you didn't listen to me and you turn this on inside of here, inside the space, and you got 100 ppm of CO in here. It's gonna show you zero. And then you go back in there in the furnace room and there's 180 ppm of CO in there. It's only gonna show you 80 because you negated the first 100. This is a strict protocol that I'm sorry, as I look at all of you, I don't have any wiggle room for, and I don't have any patience, nor does the rest of the experts in the industry have any patience for you to do it any differently than this. Because if you do it that any, any other different way, you're doing it wrong, okay? But this will save a life. And what this comes down to is this. You can have CO migrating from different sources, okay? Remember, when you go to a place, you're the expert. And whatever you touch, you're liable for. Okay, and even if you don't touch it because you're the last one there, you got to be very careful. And the source of the CO could be coming from something that you're not even working on, that you're not even touching. For example, you could have it coming from generator, gas grill, vehicle in the garage, clothes dryer, water heater, furnace or boiler, stove, fireplace, chimney. Okay, any of these sources, or which we don't even have pictured here, a neighbor's appliance could be venting out. And spewing out flue gases here that could be coming in through a window, an open window, or a cracked window seal, or something of that nature, or going into a, a system's intake. Okay. So if you don't wear a personal seal monitor, I encourage you to get one. Now, your customers are going to have monitors, chances are, but I don't want you to trust them. Why? Chances are they got them from one of the big box stores. I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to name names of CO detectors. But if you look at the instructions or the the disclaimers in the back of those, those monitors, they go off after 70 to 300 ppm, after one to three hours of exposure. All you get is nine ppm over 24 hours, 35 ppm over eight. Those are the acceptable levels and that is it, okay? CO, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, okay? However, when your customer tells you that they think they smell CO, oh. don't think that they're crazy, even yeah, though they can't. Is. Right, it, it, right. Even though they can't smell and taste it, here's the thing. They're smelling the byproducts of some combustion process chains are going, going on. In that makeup, even though it can't be smelled or you can't smell it or taste it, in that makeup, there could be CO in there because that could be one of the byproducts of that combustion process. They just can't smell it or taste it. So interlaced or interwoven in there, it could be there. So don't think that they're crazy. I know we all have crazy customers. Don't think that they're crazy. Kind of take that advice if you be so kind. So anyway, we've zeroed out. We're all ready to go. So your customer's going to say to you, you don't have to monitor the ambient environment here. It's unnecessary because I have the detectors. You're going to say to them, sir, ma'am, with all due respect, I appreciate that. However, this is a calibrated device that I can trust because I have it maintained by a lab and I send it in every year for calibration so I can trust its operational abilities here. So you're gonna say, I think it's great that you have one. I just need to do this. And you can come with me as I do it so we can monitor the ambient environment together. So you're going to hold up the slack on your hose, so you don't trip over it. And your probe goes right here across your chest. There's some that will train you to do it this way. Guess what happens if you trip? You spike yourself on the forehead and you look like you need to stand a slow unicorn. There's some that will instruct you to do it this way. You'll impale yourself in the throat. Not a good look. Probe goes across your shoulder like this, like this. And you look at your analyzer. You don't just hook this up and go, I'm just going to look like I'm cool. No, you're going to do your job. You're going to look. Customer can come with you because if they come with you and they watch you. Guess what? They've already bought into what you're doing. So what does that mean? That means that when you're working and you go to turn around, you're like, oh, you need to give me a little bit of space, right? Because all those customers that are right in their back pocket, every time we turn around, this is going to kind of give them give you a little bit of breathing space from them because you've been involved in you know, having you watch you go through the, the ambient environment. So once you ascertain that there's no CL, then you can go about doing what you're sent there to do. But if you encounter any PPM registering on here, windows are open, doors are open, and you start to investigate from there. Okay? So something I wanted to put down. So if you don't have a portable, if you don't wear a wearable monitor, the holidays are coming. I encourage you to, as it falls down, I encourage you to get one. Again, the holidays are coming, but if you don't have one, combustion analyzer is the perfect tool to monitor the ambient environment that could potentially save your life 
can enhance your career longevity. You can also save somebody else's a dollar a month for a portable. What does that cost? Uh, you mean the portable? You mean the portable? portable in your left hand. Oh, no, this is not one of those. This is my clicker. Oh, God. No, 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 no. No, Terrible. no, no, because no, in this event, there are portable handhelds that look like this. Okay. I just saw them yesterday when I was at a, a customer up in, uh, was I, uh, oh, no, I was down in Parkersburg, West Virginia yesterday. I forget where I'm at, but in so many places. So, no, it does look like that. Wearable devices here, or it's a, or it's a belt clip. Okay. Uh, Sense it makes a nice one. There's some other companies that make a nice one. And if anybody wants to know the best, House, yep, the best household mounted or best interior mounted detectors that are out there. Um, one called Defender, the other one called CO Experts. Those are the two best ones out there. Okay. How, so, much, how much does a portable cost? Uh, por uh, the, so the portable, the clip on ones can cost yeah. anywhere from 75 to a couple hundred dollars, the clip on ones. And then the house mounted ones, anywhere I think from 225 up to 350. But here's the thing I know they cost more than the big box store ones. <laughs> Little rule of thumb, so most of you know this, but you don't know it, maybe say it out loud. It's never a good idea to hand your family's help over to the lowest bidder. I'm just showing that out there. So you get what you pay for. If you want to keep yourself safe, you want to get yourself a good attack. So anyway, we need to have situational awareness when we're inside of a structure. So we want to be a CSI, a combustion scene investigator. We want to monitor the ambient environment for CL like I just went over. Know what the manufacturer's levels are. What does it say in the manual? Just so everybody knows what the breakpoints are here. 100 ppm or less in the stack is acceptable for CO. I want to see it as low as absolutely possible, but 100 ppm or less in the stack. 200 ppm in the stack or greater is considered to be a red tag situation. There are some manufacturers that allow you to have 400 ppm on high fire. Not a huge agreement with it, but they have it there for a reason. They must be much smarter than I because they're engineers. Bless you. Is that like across the board? For That's a blanket things? statement. The blanket statement in our industry, 100 ppm or less in the stack is acceptable. 200 ppm or greater is considered to be red tag. Okay. Just to be clear, we're not air free on this one. Correct. Let's not see yeah, where we're, we're going to get to that. Correct. Exactly. Now, does everybody know what to do? <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought on that. Oh, I just lost it. 400 parts per million. Um, well, well, it'll, it'll, it'll come to me. Too much CL. I, that's the thing. See, my hair falls out, my, 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 my chin hair turns white, and, and that's what happens. Uh, anyway, so use your analyzer correctly. Uh, I see one go to the starter protocol, like I mentioned. Know your levels, as I talked about, and also the liability side of things, okay? Um, oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. I implore all of you to have, if you don't have already, to have a red tag protocol in your companies, meaning, you could have some younger techs out there that are going to recognize somebody's system, and that customer is going to give them a hard time. Like, my, my, what is it? Is it my, 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 I'm sorry. Jeez, I'm sorry. Like our younger friend over here. If he goes to red tag at the system, they're not going to trust him because they don't think he knows anything. Meanwhile, from what I understand, you're pretty damn smart, my friend. I'll be honest with you. That, that's wonderful. And you're, you're going to be a great asset to this industry. So you can tell your parents, listen, I'm the best, because you're probably going to be. But however, well, somebody might not trust you, even though you're right. Okay, so we need to prevent him from getting jammed up. So we should have a protocol for someone like him so that he doesn't get screened. That's so where we have a company official come out with him so that nobody jams up on him. We have a protocol for dealing with this because what can happen is that as soon as as soon as he leaves and he writes like such. Thank you. So as he leaves, leaves and he turns the system off, they're going to say, you know what? I'm not going to wait for the quote. I'm going to get a little cold. I'm going to, I'm going to limp it along. You're going to limp it along and produce CO and potentially kill yourself in that structure. So we need to protect him and his career and everybody else in here for having a protocol set in place. Just throwing that out there. And then know the liability. You need to know these people can pursue you legally. And I'll get to some of that here in a little while. Here are your levels. 9 ppm over 24, 35 over 8. As we go to higher, higher PPM concentrations, things go south from there and detrimental effects happen and people pass away and we kill people. We don't want to do that. That is not our business. Our job is to bring comfort and safety. That's it. So what do these readings mean? I'm going to talk about CO air free in a little while. I want to talk about and key off on two, efficiency total and t flu. Okay. So we have efficiency total here for our purposes tonight. We're just going to use it this way. So say, for example, 
And this is something you can sell on if you haven't done this already, you can. Efficiency total is not the full efficiency of the appliance. Why? It does not match AFUE. AFUE takes into consideration 50 degree ambient temperatures typically. And um, all it also has all the other enhancements to that system, modulating variable speed and those other characteristics that it operates on. However, efficiency total is going to be pretty close. It's going to be within roughly two to five percent of the actual AFUE because it is a fuel utilization, but it does not have the modulating variable speed factors into it. Okay. But it is very, very close. So you could say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, when you bought this system, it was 80% efficient. 20 years ago. It's the best that we had at the time. It was the best that you could afford. We appreciate your business. You've had us out for all these years for maintenance with the service contract. However, now it's running at 60%. So when you bought it, 20 cents of every dollar was going up the stack and not heating your space. But now, because it's a little bit long in the tooth or it's a little bit old, it's time for it to be put out to pasture. 40 cents of every dollar is now going up the stack and not heating the home. What we can do for you is we can install a 96% efficient modulating variable speeding firms. And when we do so, our install crew is going to commission it for you. And they're going to issue you a commissioning report similar to this. And it's going to show you the efficiency on there that I want you to key off on. And you're going to see that the efficiency that we quoted you is going to be within 2 to 5% of what this reading is going to be, depending on the temperature that day. So you're going to see in real time that you're getting what you're paying for, and that these efficiency numbers that you're seeing, although they're typed out, they're not snake oil, that it actually is what you're receiving. So you're actually going to see the value you're getting for a dollar. That's something that is very easy to do. T-flow, very simple. 322.3 here, right? If we drop, drop, excuse me, drop. If we drop stack temperature, blue temperature, efficiency goes up. Here's why. If we lower the amount of therms or lower, lower the amount of BTUs going up the stack, those BTUs can only go into one place, into space, into the space to heat it, correct? Mm -hmm. So as we, it's an inverse relationship. Stack temperature goes down, efficiency goes up. Right? So there's <laughs> two minor selling points that you can use to sell the combustion analog. Guess pressure. Never assume all is fine. You want to adjust fuel pressure to the manufacturer's specifications. Never assume it's okay. Fuel flow rates and gas flow rates can change around this country on a daily basis. Typical nominal low fire is 1.7. Typical high fire is 3.5. Average rating 3.2 to 3.8. Higher settings can create very, very dangerous conditions, explosive conditions, uh, high heat conditions and the like. Lower settings can create flame impingement and other challenges. Okay, what does this look like? Let's take a look. So we have here, before and after, so our before shot here is we're going about 30, 35 ppm of CO, about 9% oxygen, and about 243 for stack temperature. Show of hands near who does combustion right now. Has anybody ever spiked your CO sensor? Thank you. For those of you that haven't, those of those that have, all that means that they were doing their job. It's going to happen. You're going to inherit situations that nobody wants, but you cannot pull your probe out quick enough so that you don't spike that CO sensor. Right. We actually, in our analyzers, some of you already have them, we have a programmable pump cutoff, so you're never going to spike that CO sensor again. We'll go through that at the very, very tail end here. So, out of all the adjustments you're going to make, the fastest thing that's going to react is going to be your CO. So, if we dial up gas pressure too much, look what happens here. Our CO starts to go through the roof. It's a linear progression. It's up to almost 75 ppm right here. The oxygen is now falling through the floor to 7.5, and the stack temperature is on the rise, going up, heading towards 250. OK, so now as a, with an over adjustment, we've now decreased potentially the service life. We have increased the danger factor and we have knocked down and decreased the efficiency of this equipment. But if you don't think that gas pressure is an important thing that we should be talking about tonight, I think you might in a second. September 14th, 2018, one person dead, 12 hospitalized, 39 homes destroyed. The one person who passed away, the person who passed away, 18-year-old young man died in his own driveway, sitting in his brand new used car that his parents bought and listening to his music because he could, because he just got his license. His chimney fell off of his home, landed on the roof of his car and killed him. What happened was, technician had gone out, uh, technician had bought an analyzer. I'm going to do the reader's digest of this version of the story because it's very sensitive. 
had bought an analyzer, thank God had done the appropriate combustion test because the different parties here were going after and attempting to sue anybody that was at those properties in the last 12 months. Anybody. This one technician, this one technician was the only technician that had been there within the last 12 and it was a rental property. They were pursuing this technician legally. At one point, the lawsuit was in excess of $80 million, as mm -hmm. we know. They were suing him. They were listing his parents in the lawsuit, and they had listed his two sisters in the lawsuit. So if you don't think people can come after you and your family, you are mistaken. They can. So what happened was he did his combustion analysis, yes, but he also did two other things, what we call combustion extracurriculars, because they don't show up automatically. He also did his draft which you do by just re, you know, zeroing out the draft sensor and using that probe. And then he also did his gas pressure that day. So he hooked up the manometer hose kit, did his gas pressure. Gas pressure was 3.5. Gas pressure was fine. He went to court. He was released. No issue. What happened was they found out through further investigation by uh, of the gas company in question that instead of the fuel being delivered to these properties in inches of water column, oh, it was delivered at over... 200 psi. What? So they could not confirm nor deny that their system was not pirated. Okay. So what happened was regulators were taken off since it's removed. Okay. They've done investigations into this. From what I understand, the first part of this case is settled for 59 million, and they're going in for the second part, which is going to be considerably more than that. It has been confirmed three times now, luckily, that Thankfully, only 39 homes went up in flames and, and one person passed, which is one person too many and 39 homes too many. But it was only a demand. It was not a demand day for heat. The day that it happened, it was 75 degrees. And the 39 homes that went up were the 39 homes calling for their domestic hot water off of their boilers. They have confirmed three times now that if this was a demand day for heat, all 12,000 houses on the grid would have potentially gone up in flames. It's a bit of an Armageddon. And because this person did the gas pressure, they were able to submit their combustion analysis when they when they went to court. They have proof beyond the shadow of a doubt. Because here's the thing, everybody. I'm going to start to preach for a second now. You cannot control what happened before you got there. You cannot control what happens after you leave. But you sure as heck can control your actions while you're there, which means testing, which means accounting for these things. Even if it's beyond combustion, and we're talking about refrigeration for you guys, and doing other things. Control your actions, do the necessary requisite measurements you're supposed to be taking, <clears throat> make the industry look good and proper, and do your jobs effectively. Okay. And if that wasn't enough to drive it home, I'm a little stupid here to make the point clear. Imagine coming home and seeing that. That's not what we want. That is not what we want. That is not what we want. So draft. Draft is a pressure measurement. That excuse me, that lets us know the rate of, at which the byproducts of combustion are leaving or terminating or exiting the <laughs> combustion zone. When we talk about draft, we want to measure it in a hot stack within five minutes of steady state operation. And when we discuss it, we talk about it in the context of two different avenues. One in the concept or the or the description of an atmospheric system, the other with a condensing system. Atmospheric atmospheric system uses makeup or rooming, which obviously influences its combustion process which also influences its stretch process. So some of the hangups or challenges to an atmospheric system are not enough makeup air. That influences how a system operates, right? We have competition for makeup air. We have an incorrect stack size. For the life of me, I don't understand why we pull off a flue pipe, and then we decide we want to outthink the room and re-engineer it and put a different size on, and we affect the draft. We don't want to do such things. We want to pay attention to the way that it was designed. We could have a barometric damper that's giving us a challenge. We could have a chimney. That has a challenge, there's a pocket in it through the flue gases, wearing it away over time, creating a pocket where things sit and they kind of go down, right? That's an issue. Or during COVID, this has become very prevalent. Changes to a furnace or boiler room. We have customers out there that are modifying their furnace or boiler room. They're taking that room, making it into an office. They're removing their louver door and they're saying, you know what? I can list, still listen to my kids learning virtually some of the time, especially during COVID, this was happening. It's driving me crazy. So now I'm going to take up the drop ceiling. I'm going to seal it off and make it like a bank vault. So what have they done? They've choked it. If I choke any one of us, we can't get oxygen, we can't breathe, right? That's the same thing with the system. If it doesn't get the appropriate amount of oxygen into it, it can't breathe, it can't function, and it short cycles and it cuts out and creates a problem. That's with an atmospheric system. The other one over here, I'm going to step out of the camera view for a second, is a condensing system. Operates in a different modality. It receives its intake air from fresh air outside. 
Okay, look at the blue air coming in here, right? So one of the challenges we have for this kind of system is induced stress motor not functioning correctly, creating an issue. But one of the other things that's happened quite a bit are exhaust vent blockages. I'm not going to go into the crazy stories. I would do that in a longer version of this, but just some of the things that have happened recently. Somebody pulled 60 chestnuts out of an exhaust vent, either a rodent or a child, where we have the, remember for kids, in <clears throat> backyards, idle hands in a devil's playground. They say kids say the damnedest things, kids do the darndest things. So either it was by an animal or by a kid putting chestnuts in there, an exhaust pipe coming out. Somebody put three bags of marijuana, or what we refer to as the devil's cabbage, in an exhaust vent. Not a good idea by a, an older teenage son in a property that a technician went to. Some kid filled his parents' furnace with water with a garden hose. Never a good thing to do. Never a good thing to do. Uh, not nice. Huh? Yep, right. And then we heard recently of when I was up in Buffalo, new oil company, excuse me, a new driver for an oil company went to a block they normally go to. It was dusk. But one of these customers had an oil to gas conversion, had a brand new carrier furnace put in. Beautiful, pristine. Oh, oh, oh. This oil delivery company went to the wrong house. Went to the wrong house, hooked up, turned it on, over $20,000 in damage to the basement and obviously killed the system. So we have things that happen. Also, birds, rodents take up <laughs> in there. We don't know. So we have blockages to those things that we need to verify. Okay. But the main thing I want to show you, and it goes to when you had asked me about cross contamination, Here are the, here's where this comes into play. Right. So this is one of the functions of an analyzer. I don't have to get up here like Vanna White and do this here for a second, outside of not having blonde hair and having a rather unshanted figure. But anyway, so when we're venting a condensing system, right? You're looking at your install buddy going, does it look vented right to you? It looks good, right? Your buddy, your install buddy looks at you and says, if her dog bites my ankle one more time, I'm going to punch you in the face. We're leaving. Okay, let's go. But we don't have any way to confirm that it's been done correctly. We can do all the measurements we want. Here's what I want you to do. One, when you're installing, this goes to you. I think you were in my class, right? Were you in my class at Wolf Brothers? Were you in my class at Wolf? Honestly, how long ago? That was a little while ago. You look like the gentleman that was there. Not that you, you maybe have a doppelganger. So let's take a look alike. So if you do, you might want to check your twin. So I don't know if anybody's home with your wife right now, but you might want to make sure the dog is <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. Listen, I travel a lot. I don't know what goes on in my home. And I'm not <laughs> I know there are much better lo looking versions of me on there. So anyway, so I want you to turn on all the appliances in that house. Why? Fuel fire, fuel fire ones. I want to make sure that you have no migration from any of the fuel fire appliance making their way into this fresh air intake. Okay. Also, why? Your system is designed that you just installed is designed to ingest, receive, or take in 20.9% oxygen, like the air that we breathe. We're designed to breathe in 20.9. Your system is anything that is less than 20.9 20 is potentially creating NOx, an acidic, poisonous gas, which eats whatever it touches. That's why when I mentioned to you, our warranty claims are 30 to 40%. We're returning equipment that's been installed incorrectly, and we're causing it to age and rot away from the inside out. What is that like when you're not taking a 20.9% oxygen? Here's what it's like. It's like every day before you go to work, your significant other walks by your coffee cup, puts a couple of droplets of Drano in there, and then moseys on his or her way, right? It just keeps going, right? Starts to rot at your esophagus, starts to cough up a little bit of blood, a little bit of an issue. What are you doing? You're rotting or decaying from the inside out or wearing away from the inside out. That is what you're doing in this system. When you allow it to receive or ingest or take in less than 20.9% oxygen. So here's what you're going to do. I'm going to create a little hole here in the fresh air intake, six to eight inches up. Oh. Put your probe in. You never bought it out. Just everybody knows you don't kiss the back wall. If you do, you disengage and go midway in because you want to draw in a proper sample. So when you're doing that, when you put your probe in there, you're going to look at your analyzer screen. You're going to make sure that you are taking in, receiving in 20.9% oxygen. If you are not, it is beyond, you cannot disprove it, you are, have cross-contamination. So if it's less than 20.9, you have cross-contamination, which means you either have migration from this combustion process, making its way in because you didn't vent it as well as you thought you did, or you have another combustion process in that structure 
bringing in those byproducts. Or we have a neighbor's appliance, depending on how close the houses are together, because outside of where we live in a more elaborate environment here, we're more spaced apart. You're going to work in environments where the houses are a little bit closer. Another combustion process terminating its full gases, coming into your fresh air intake, creating a problem. Or you've installed something, and in your wizardry to try to be your own little landscape architect, you go, put a little boxwood hedge here. I know, and it's right by the side of the house here. We should be okay. I know it looks like the Christmas tree from the from Charlie Brown, but it'll be all right. It'll grow. Well, guess what? It grows and it matures. What does it do? It creates an air curtain. And every year you work on your furnace, so the mechanic comes out and goes, it's a little weird. We want to keep an eye on this. Only to realize that this boxwood hedge has created a full mature hedge. And as the exhaust gases come out, they hit here. And they, whatever doesn't pass through bounces off. And the fresh air intake pulls it back in. So finer nuances of what you need to check. And you should be doing this and checking this stuff even after install, because you're going to go to properties where you didn't install and you didn't do the process and you have no idea what the cause of that intake error is. Okay, I think it's gonna be an eye opener for you. So hopefully that answers your question. This one of the seven tools is the cross-contamination verification. Okay? Commissioning a new piece of equipment, if it's new, why the heck do we need to test? Well, we assume it's set up correctly. It might not be. It might not be set up correctly. We don't know. Setup can change in transit, which means this. Things can become jostled and shaken in during transport. Every new system is like a new car. It needs a little bit of love, a little bit of massaging. We are under the misconception that the equipment that we're getting is plug and play. It is not. It needs to be verified. It might not need to be tweaked, but it sure as heck needs to be verified. What is the gas pressure we're installing? I think we've discussed that adequately. Commissioning instructions are typically in the unit or with the install manual. Parameters for CO2, O2, and CO. Follow it, okay? And if there are not, there are industry averages out there that I can even get you if you want. There are industry averages out there to tell you where you should be sitting for the different systems that you're installing. But I encourage you to use your default as a manual. The manual doesn't tell you for some magical mystery tour reason. Go to this document that I can furnish you. And then venting. We want to make sure that we have Follow the manual, but we want to make sure we check the quality of that intake air for those condensing systems. And even if it's an atmospheric system that's in a structure that you're going in to do maintenance at, for example, even though it's not fresh and new, we want to make sure there's no off-gassing of any kind of lacquers or paint thinners or anything else that's, that's changing the indoor environment that the system is pulling in, because that's going to drop the oxygen intake. And your analyzer is going to show you on your screen if that is the case, okay? Just by the ambient conditions there for that instance. So seasonal maintenance. Why should we combustion test every time we engage a fuel fire appliance? Well, if you touch it, you're liable for it. We've already discussed that with the gas pressure issue, so I'm not going to belabor it. Then the Massachusetts and the New York court cases, we've already talked about the Massachusetts one. What I will discuss in brief, it's not a court case, but it's this. Recently, outside of where my office is located, so two hours away from my office in PA is Allentown. They decided a situation there where 34 people went to the hospital for seal poisoning. 30 children, four adults from daycare so. Akron, Ohio here a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago when I was here. Timber top. Yep. Yeah, I used to live there too. Yep. A woman died of seal poisoning from a boiler. <clears throat> the three people that died at the Sandals Resort this past spring in the Bahamas wasn't because they drank too much and ate too much. Mm -mm. And all inclusives are fun, but that did not kill them. They had seal poisoning. That's what killed them. And then we just had two American tourists out of Mexico that died at an Airbnb for seal poisoning. So what happens? We need to have situational awareness, as I keep saying, we need to pay attention to this stuff because you want to protect yourself, you want to protect the occupants in that space. Also, what we have here, can't tell how it's running just by looking at it. We all know we've dated those beautiful people before that we think are magnificent. <laughs> we get to know them, we're like, oh my God, I'm dating Satan, right? We've all been there before, right? Did the last technician leave it running correctly? We don't know, we don't know. We, have, we can't leave that to chance. Things happen in homes in between visits. You're working in living and breathing environments that change. We need to make sure that we're checking that. Did the gas pressure change from the last visit? We don't know. We have to verify that. Check the draft. Did an animal take up tenement inside that exhaust? Did a bird create a nest in a chimney? What, what is the situation? We need to make sure we're checking the vent so that the flu gases can exit the flu correctly, whether it's atmospheric or condensing. And then did you do the blood work on that system, a.k.a. the combustion analysis? Seasonal combustion analysis checklist. Make sure you're checking these items. You want to do your draft. You want to do your gas pressure. 
You want to do your combustion analysis. You want to verify for a crack heat exchanger on a uh, forced air system. You want to check for cross contamination on a condensing system, which we just went over as well. And then you want to check for ambient CO. And I'm going to go over crack heat exchanger test here in a little while. Using your analyzer is a diagnostic tool. How can we find, solve, and prevent problems with a combustion analyzer? Three pillars diagnose, solve, prevent. Diagnose. What direction is the analysis pointing with? As you get the readout, it's going to give you either the direct indication to say repair or replace this, or like I said before, it's going to give you a series of breadcrumbs that's going to lead you down that path. When you ascertain what that repair is, you're going to do said repair, but you're going to do a test. You're going to retest the system. You're going to verify if the numbers were off here, the number should now be within spec here as a result of your repair. If not, you need to further investigate it. Okay? And then prevent. You're going to test it every visit to prevent those costs of repairs. You want to be that pro in a proactive. And I promise that no little children are hurt in the making of this video. Um, anyway, you've got to have kids in kennels, why wouldn't you? Uh -huh. Diagnosing a system using an analyzer. So a sample of some of the things you can look at. For example, CO spike of 2,000 ppm or above at light off. Possible indicator of delayed ignition, igniter issue, possible thermal couple. You don't know. Again, breadcrumbs. O2 spike when the fan comes on. Do we have a gasket issue or do we have a crack in a primary heat exchanger? I'm going to go over that in a second. CO spike at shutdown. Possible indicator of a leaky valve. Again, requires further investigation. O2 starts to drop after readings have stabilized. Possible secondary heat exchanger filling with water not draining. That's a problem. And then draft not within spec. Do we have a draft inducer issue? Do we have a blockage? Do we have a barometric damper issue? What is the problem? Or do we have a compromised chimney? Right. General combustion analysis advice. These are things that will help you along your combustion path. Natural draft units should be tested under the draft inverter if possible. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Also, if you have the three cells that are staring you in the face, you can put your probe right in the cell, which means right in the fire. <clears throat> some, and I'm not picking on anybody, competitor wise, some competitors, thermocouples don't go up as high as ours. They go up to five to 700 degrees. You can burn it to thermocouple. So if you're not using mine, look at the manual and the instructions on it. Ours goes up to 1500 degrees. I know the dastardly things you're going to do with it, as do my <coughs> colleagues. We designed it in product development because we know the hell you're going to put it through. So we'll call your bluff. Go ahead and put it through hell. It's going to come back for more. Okay, so put your probe right in there because you might have two cells that are bad, but one or two cells that are good, but one cell that's bad, you won't know until you test it. High efficiency, 90% or greater. Test no less than one foot above that inducer outlet, but no greater than two. Efficiency, as I mentioned earlier, relates to combustion efficiency, which is fuel utilization, not the overall efficiency of the appliance, but it is close, as we talked about earlier. Evaluate oxygen during the entire combustion cycle. Check for stabilization, escalation, and decline. Same thing with CO. Does it spike at startup? Does it come down to level at, or specification spec level when it hits steady state? And then does it fire off high at the end of the cycle? You are looking for symptomatic things. When we're looking at O2 and we're looking at CO, we're looking for erratic, unpredictable behavior that we need to kind of snap the leash on. And we all know if you've ever walked a very large dog, if it's choker colorotic, you have to because it's so huge. And if it starts to get out of line, you got to kind of pop the, pop the leash, give a little bit of a correction, make the dog kind of heal. It's kind of like that. You're always looking at the oxygen and the CO, most specifically the CO, by dialing oxygen, by having to potentially snap that leash and, dry, and, and get it in line. And then when we talked about CO air freight, which is what Tom brought up earlier, when you're monitoring the ambient environment, use regular CO on your analyzer. When you are doing combustion analysis, it is my recommendation, that of my mentor, that of the other experts in the industry, that you use CO air free. CO air free is your CO number with the oxygen extracted out of it. Or for those of you that like alcohol at five minutes to seven in the evening, it's like a bourbon neat, undiluted bourbon. Okay. So here's the thing. If your CO air free number, which is your hell number, if your hell number looks like heaven, you're in good shape. So if you really want to drill down and you really want to do this correctly, because we're all trying to get smarter and try to advance in our careers, because this is a career for us, not a job. You want to use CO air free as your primary modus operandi for looking at 
combustion analysis, and the amount of CO in a system. And then again, if you look at a regular CO, it's like bourbon on the rocks. That's what you do if you're monitoring the situation. So CO air free is outside? No, CO air free is a figure on here that takes the oxygen that the analyzer is reading, because regular CO also has the buffer of oxygen in there, regular CO. So it's CO, a little bit of oxygen in there that the analyzer is reading. Okay. okay. So if we're monitoring the ambient environment, that's okay. But CO air free is a measurement that the analyzer has that takes the oxygen that it's reading, takes it, and chucks it to the side, and gives you only pure unadulterated CO. Oh. So that is your hell number. So it basically, there's no fluff factor in there. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like if you have a, if you have a dude that thinks he's huge and he puts like things in his shoulders and makes himself look he's huge, that's CO. Pop the shoulder pads up. CO air free is what his actual physique looks like. So it's just like it's a minimized version. But in this case, the CO air free is the concentrated version of CO, where the CO, uh, the CO air free is, whereas regular CO has that oxygen still in that factor. Oh, where is that actually? It shows it right on your display. I mean, where's the, the uh, probe the, when the, you do this? Oh, the probe is in the stack. I'll put it through that in a second. Yep, yep. Very good question, though. Very good question. That's actually the next thing I want to get to. All right. Yep, no, we're in good shape. There we go. Okay. So here is a testing protocol for you. Okay. Mm. This here is a positioning cone for this here. This is what we use to, when we create our hole in the stack that we actually put in, we screw in because it's threaded, it prevents the probe from falling out. So if you didn't use this, you put the probe in, and the probe is sitting like this, and the probe falls out, and you go, got it. Ah. What do you got? <laughs> Burn. Burn, right? Exactly. Look at the third degree burns. We're not a nightclub act. I thought that was like a limiter to keep you from like going too far. Well, it's not, but also people have also thought that this is something that you take and you chuck at the customer's child who keeps reaching into your tool pouch. That's happened before. I didn't do it. Somebody made that. I'm like, I wish you wouldn't throw it at somebody. It's made of stainless. It's like you got the message. I'm like, I would. Ah. Anyway, so we use this to make it level because when you put this in, you screw this in, it goes into a certain point. Probe goes in, obviously halfway into the stack, a little farther up, and you tighten this down so everything stays nice and level for you. So we see that up here, okay? So we go six to eight inches above this breach here, probe goes in midway. So before we get there, we would have done the auto zero outside, excuse me, come into the ambient environment monitoring of the um, for the CO test, start the appliance up, select the appropriate fuel in the analyzer, and I'll get to the fuel type and its importance here in a second. And then we can locate the proper testing point, again, which is a six to eight inches up, use the positioning code, put the probe in, and we test. We want to test within five minutes of steady state operation, but I encourage you to do a test that light off because I'm not worried about your spike, spike in my CO sensor because you have the protection on there. Once you do one light off, minimum, one at light off, one at steady state, and one at shutdown because I want to see erratic behavior. I'm looking more for erratic behavior on the tail end of things, with the with the with, or midway to the tail end of things. That's where problems are going to rear their heads. Okay. Then a shutdown protocol. When the test is over, take the probe out, let the analyzer get back to its pretest conditions. When you take the probe out, don't just set it down. It's going to be hot. Give it a minute or so. Start doing this. Feel the ambient heat coming off of it, and you kind of do it, and then you're okay. Then you can put it down. Or you press the off button. You want to make sure you empty the water trap here because condensate can build up in here. There is also an O-ring in here. If you do not have this O-ring and you lose it, you're going to think that my analyzer is a piece of garbage. And I'm going to say, why are you plaguing me? How come you don't like me? And you're going to say, this thing was great up until yesterday. And I'm going to say, you must have lost something. I'm going to ask you to take your water trap apart. And I'm going to ask you for your where your O-ring is. And you're going to tell me, oh my God, I must have lost that. What does that mean? That means that uh, Chris and I have seen this in real time. Chris has actually doubled it on a house call version. And it's not a fault of our analyzer. It's any water trap like this, you have to pay attention. Me. Situational awareness. Okay. That'll make your oxygen go like 18%, but it'll make your excess air go like 560. And you're like, yeah, that's wrong. Okay. So make sure that we have that O-ring and we put the water trap back together correctly. Before you turn oh. this off, I want to make sure that you have zero CO on your display reading. Why? When you hit turn this off, it's going to go through a purge, which means it's going to expel, purge, or discharge 
the remnants of those combustion tests that we talked about, or at least this one, out of the probe and hose and out of the analyzer. But it is done based on a time limit that you've set. It's either set for 30 seconds or it's set for 60 seconds. Okay. If you have, say, 20 ppm of CO sitting on that analyzer and, the, and that against those sensors at that time, and you hit the off button, it might not purge out, which I can bet it's not going to probably that quickly. It might not purge out that 20 ppm out of that analyzer, which means what? CO is sitting on that CO sensor. CO sensors have a sensor life, but it is based on, like a boxer, how many body blows and headshots it can take over the course of its lifespan before it puts its hands up and goes, I can't do any more. I'm going to die. That's what it's like. So what you want to do is you want to take the ability for it to die earlier than expected away from it by controlling your actions and making sure that you don't have any CO registered on that display. Once you see zero, you hit the off button, but don't do anything yet. Once you hit the off button, leave it alone. So to go through the purge, like I just mentioned, it's going to expel all the remnants of the combustion test out of the probe and hose, out of the analyzer, then it's going to shut itself off for you automatically. After it shuts itself off, then you can attach the probe and hose. But do not attach it until that's done. Otherwise, you're going to lose the ability to have the purge. Purge also out of your so Just a little piece of advice. Rooftops, we're not going to belabor this point for the purposes of time tonight. But you can test on a rooftop. This nice hearty gentleman's doing it here. Then pipe is here. Probe goes here. We're not going to talk about industrial because tonight that will make your heads explode. And we don't want to do that. Right. Here's what I was talking about earlier with you about the different cells. Put your probe right in there. I'm not going to ruin at least my analyzer. Um, and any decent analyzer, you're not going to ruin either, but you just want to look at the instructions on it. Okay. Something else I just want to cue off on here. There's a couple of other testing points. So, for example, on this upflow system, we have it right here where we do our draft test and our combustion test, okay? And then here, we want a draft test above the draft hood in the, in the, in the diluted gases here. Make sure the draft hood is working correctly. But we want a combustion test down here in the undiluted gases. Mm -hmm. One more thing I want to show you is this, water here. Okay. Do your draft test up here, again, above the hood, and then try to get your probe down into the tank. If you have to create a little spot here in the hood, you can do that. We have just come out with... Uh, as of today, as a matter of fact, a brand new flexible probe that you can bend up to 90 degrees. Um, so it's pretty neat for the market here. Uh, pretty interesting um, product that we just created. That's going to solve a lot of dilemmas where there's difficult access for you guys out there. That's going to take care of a lot of it for you. So we have that on offer, which if that was the case here, that flexible probe would just pop right into there pretty much. Robert, can you back up a couple slides to the 90% please? <clears throat> Now, you had mentioned before that you want the probe and the exhaust on a 90% furnace within a couple of parameters. Yes, for the most part, yes. What's going to change if you take it at the, the uh, termination? I mean, like outside termination? No, besides, it's, besides temperature. It's, I don't, it, the flue gas is to me, I want it at that. I want it at that exit point out of the system. I don't want it at the farthest point down the line because I don't know what else is kind of just sitting dormant in that flu pipe down the line. I don't know if you've had a backdraft, if anything comes in. So if you've got a backdraft, something blows back into the first few feet of here and you're testing over here, you're not going to get a true test. I want it down here because the pressure is here, even though it's not, or it's not here, excuse me, even though it's not the, um, even though it's not a, a major issue and you can still have pressure, pressure differentials here, you're getting a more, I want to say this correctly, a more rich sample that is going to have, it's going to let you know if you have challenging conditions. I want as less dilution properties of flue gases if they're not supposed to be diluted as, hence, post the draft hood, okay. as absolutely possible. Okay. Um, there are certain non-negotiables. I want you to try to do your best with this situation. But like, for example, start up and shut down protocol of the analyzer. It's not negotiable. It's like one of those things where something something happens and it's not supposed to happen. We said that can't happen. That's one of those things. It can not happen that you don't use your analyzer correctly, at least at that startup protocol. Okay. So 
I'm not going to go over B values tonight. Here is what it looks like going up behind the draft of her, as I mentioned before. This is what that looks like when I talked about that earlier. I want to talk about something else, though, now. I want to talk about efficiency. I mentioned earlier about selecting the appropriate fuel type and how that's important. And this is where this comes into play. In an analyzer, you have an oxygen sensor, yes. If you have a CO sensor, you do not have a CO2 sensor. CO2 is a calculated value. Okay. It is calculated based on the fuel type that you select. Every fuel type in your analyzer has a coefficient assigned to it. A coefficient is a multiplier. It's an identifier, but it's much more important than that. For example, number two oil might be 0 0.076982143 That coefficient, that multiplier, is multiplied by the percentage of oxygen that your analyzer is reading. That resulting answer of that multiplication is what provides for you your calculated CO2. So if you have the wrong fuel type selected on your analyzer, your CO2 is going to be off. And if that is off, your efficiency calculation is going to be off. Why? Because CO2 is a precursor or an indicator or a participant in the calculation of efficiency. The three calculating factors are this. Fuel type that you select. CO2 that it produces by selecting the correct fuel, and the delta T or change in temperature. So for an atmospheric system, it's pretty basic. We have, as you see here, a 70 degree ambient temperature, a 300 degree stack temperature, that produces a delta T of 230. Pretty simple, pretty basic, no intervention on your part, okay? Everybody's been doing it correctly for years because there's been no operator intervention needed. Here's where things change. Condensing system. You are taking in fresh air from the outside. <laughs> if you have been using the room air for that system you're working on and, 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 and not taking the intake air temperature for a condensing system, you've been doing it wrong every time. It's not because you're not smart, it's because you haven't been shown. I'm going to show you that. Here's what happens though. Same for time. <laughs> we didn't use the 20 degrees here, right? We go back, we use a 70. 70 degree air because we're using ambient because we don't know what we're not we don't know enough to do it this way. That gives us a delta T of 30. What does that mean? That means you're 96% efficient that you system that you installed. You go into the home and I go, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, I knew we were good. I didn't think we were this good. The system we put in is supposed to be 96% efficient. Watch me as I dislocate my shoulder. I'm gonna pat myself on the back. You're running at 114% efficiency. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you're not, genius. Not at all. Because you use 70 degree air, not the 20 degree air that is outside. So it's not your fault. Here's why. <clears throat> because a lot of you either don't know this process or a lot of you have been using analyzers that do not give you a secondary type K thermocouple port like we do. When you plug in either our separate type K thermocouple, which has a probe on it, either ours or your own type K thermocouple, you don't have to use mine, you plug it into here, this combustion analyzer automatically knows that you're working on a condensing system. Bypass is taking the temperature from here, takes it from that auxiliary probe, automatically populates the analyzer correctly, gives you correct combustion efficiency. So either your probe or mine, that didn't sound right, use your own thermocouple or mine, perfectly fine. However, many ways to get the wrong. If you don't have your thermocouple and you don't have mine, you can go in here and you can manually override the temperature in here, which means you can go in, you're going to go onto your phone, go onto the Weather Channel app, it's going to say, oh, it's 20 degrees where you're at right now. You're going to go into here, hit the override button, type in 20 degrees, it's going to populate the analyzer, give you the correct combustion efficiency, you're going to save the data point, and then you're going to unoverride that because you want to have it be normal the next time you go to use it until you get a thermocouple. Okay, so even if you don't have a type K thermocouple, you're not going to be jammed up on the field. You're going to be able to use it correctly. Okay, so just everybody knows. So what you're going to do is when you take this temperature here, you're going to put that again. You're going to use that same hole that you used when you install this to take the quality of that intake here. It's the exact same spot you're going to use to take that temperature. Okay. So very, very important that you do the history. Now, what about a uh, house that's uh, built in 55 that's 
a lot of leakage around the doors and windows. And the door test, the, the guy that did the door test in the house said, you don't need an outside air intake. You got enough leakage around the doors and windows. Oh, okay. A condensing system operationally is designed to condense. If you take that system's ability to condense away from it, it's not going to function as effectively as it should. Now, there are some equipment manufacturers in their manuals that will allow you to do it that way. I recommend you do what you want. I recommend that you always bring in fresh, unencumbered air. Why? For the second point. Here's why. Basements, areas like that, you usually have other chemicals in them right. that influences things, that influences behavior. It's not an old school atmospheric system that is built like a tank. This is a more finesse product that has finer accoutrements in it, computerized boards and everything else. If you allow it to take in anything that is not that pure 24.9% oxygen, and you have other things in the atmosphere, other things, other mycotoxins, other things that can't be measured, coming into that system, into, into how it's bringing in spread, bringing in its air from that basement, right? You run the risk of knocking down the service lights. Now, I've had this debate, not debate, I've had this brought up when I've been, for example, in Fargo, North Dakota, Okay. where contractors have said, you don't know what it's like. Zero. Exactly. You know what it's like to live here. We don't want to run it out there. And then at the same time, there's another faction in that room going, nope, you're lazy. We run it outside every time. And they have this nice little cute argument, and then they both shake hands, <laughs> and that's it. So, again, I strongly recommend that if it's a condensing system that you install correctly, because it's meant to condense, it's meant to do that operationally from a computerized standpoint, from a general performance standpoint. So are you saying it won't condense as well? Or? It won't condense as well because you're not bringing in, it's designed to have those lower temperatures brought into it so it can function correctly. It's designed to drop temperatures and turn over, turn over, and use that, those, those, the latent heat store, for example, to drive up the efficiency of that system. And that's when you have a condensing system. That's one of the properties. It's how it operates internally to produce a higher efficiency. Well, there would be more latent heat in the without the outside because the uh, twenty degree air is going to have a lot less. Correct, heat. but it's going to turn it over. You want it. You want it to condense. You want it to turn that air over because it's designed to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, my my even my greater concern is what is in the properties of that air. So again. There are some manuals that would allow you to do that. It is my recommendation that you always try to keep a condensing system, a condensing system by bringing in fresh, unencumbered, unpolluted air from the outdoor bar. As we wrap up here, before we talk a little bit about product for two seconds, I want to go over crack heat exchanger verification. This is important. This is for any forced air system. Okay. So when you get there, if the system is running, let it run for another three to four minutes, shut it off, let it mellow out. If it is not running when you get there, turn it on, let it get up to steady state operating, operational characteristics or operational procedures. Let it run for five to six minutes at steady state, shut it off, let it mellow out. Then you're gonna do this test. Providing you've already done the ambient seal monitoring, you've zeroed out the analyzer outside and all these other things. When you get down to the furnace room, you definitely wanna make sure you're 20.9% oxygen. Once you mount your analyzer, Put your probe in the stack, turn the system on. When you do, you turn the system on, combustion is going to start, is going to kick in, it's going to start to terminate flue gases, right? So it's going to start to generate flue gases, right? What's going to happen is that you're going to see your oxygen plummet from 20.9, because remember, we're measuring flue gases now, or byproducts of combustion. And then you're going to see your CO start to go up, okay? And it's going to become a little bit unsettled, and eventually it's going to settle itself down around anywhere from 12 to 15 seconds. When that happens, for example, say it settles at 4.8% oxygen, great. Then you're really going to pay attention to your analyzer screen because then the fan's going to come on about another 10, 15 seconds later. When it does so, you're gonna see your, your, uh, um, your oxygen possibly go up. If you do, and it goes up 2% or greater, you potentially, or you probably have a crack in that heat exchanger, why? Now, keep in mind, prior to the last couple of years, we used to do 1% as an uptick. There was too much variability between electronic tools. Now we use the benchmark as 
So the 2% or, or greater increase in oxygen is a probable criteria changer. Here's the reason. You have a sealed combustion process that you're working with, and you're not making adjustments to a system. You're not bringing any additional oxygen. Okay. So what's happening is when, this, when the fan comes on, it creates negative pressure. It's doing this, sucking in. And if there's a crack in the heat exchanger, it's sucking in the oxygen because of the negative pressure. It's bringing it in. Because you have a sealed combustion party with no other guests invited. But this guest is coming into the back door on that crack because of negative pressure pulling it in going, oh, please come in. Please come in. Driving the oxygen. Okay? Because what do we do now for crack heat exchangers? We do visual inspection. What you might see, he might not see. Tom, what you might see, I might not see. Joe, what you might see, Chris might not see. All the way through here, we have experience levels that's all over the spectrum. What does that mean? Variability. What does variability mean to a contractor? Liability. Nobody wants liability. That is why we do this. So whether you're an apprentice or you're an expert, it is irrelevant You can find a crack TV changer. I got a call last week by a contractor who's condemned six systems since they got our analyzers two months ago. Crack data changes. Two of them were condemned by their apprentice. Service managers didn't believe them. Goes out to both job sites and goes, nope. He got it 100% definitely cracked. But they also used it to verify that an additional two did not have a crack. I was up in Parkersburg, West Virginia last night testing. They have an old... Um, Lennox Pulse Furnace that was put in, I think, in 1990. They were sure it had a crack heat exchange. Mm -hmm. It was running and humming along just as the other ones that were put in like five years ago. The same thing. The CO was next to nothing. The oxygen was like at, like at 6%. Um, it, it, was, it was humming along like crazy. So there's no crack. There was no issues. And they never thought operationally that it was that way. They just thought based on age, it's that way. So sometimes things are made less, sometimes they're not. In this case, that Lennox system was thriving. And it was literally purring, and it was amazing. Okay, So we don't want to judge it with cover. But again, you can do this, and it is repeatable. If a customer doesn't believe you, you can have them do it. I've had technicians take the customer outside and go, we're going to auto-zero this out together. You're, you're going to see in real time, you're going to do this test. That was what I showed you before. This customer does it. They don't want to do it, but they do it. Press the buttons, do everything else. They watch the escalation. They're like, oh, my God, it's, you're right. So, again, it negates the argument when they get to see it. So, again, you can prove you have the shadow of a doubt that you have a crack. It does mean that you don't try to get a picture of it and you abandon your test ability. I'm not saying that. Don't let the machines take over, but still... This should accent your career and it will be a great aid in you to find those crack data changes and will make you and your company's money. Mm. Uh. So, BPI contracting. If anybody here is in the BPI space, an analyzer is a required tool for you to use. Uh, we are big in the BPI space now. All of our analyzers are what they call BPI 1200 certified. So, every analyzer can be using BPI work. I'm not going to belabor that. Making money, I'm just going to touch upon this for a split second. With an analyzer, we all know if in this bit, in this room here, you should all be offering service contracts. Service contracts are like assets under management. The more service contract people you have, the greater their chance to stay with you and not defect because they'll prepay their maintenance with you. So as long as you don't mess it up, they're not going to leave you. So the more of those you have listed under, under your management, the better off that you are. You list a Combustion analysis as a line item for what you're going to give them if they take out a contract. This is part of the contract deal. You're going to draw on service contract customers. We've had con contractors all over the country drive up their profitability just by adding this in as a line item because they've actually listened to our advice and they've done it and they've seen it in real time. I'm not going to belabor these slides here. I just want to get to a few more things. We all know the reasons why we should be testing, which is what I went over tonight. A um, few things follow the startup and shutdown protocol, check for air leaks. Cold truck storage, again, you get 40 degrees and lower, bring that puppy in at night, okay? Don't want to have it sitting out in the cold truck. Talk about emptying your water truck before with the O-rings. Want to make sure that the filter is white, because that's what it's supposed to be, okay? And then we want to perform our yearly maintenance on our and calibration. We want to send your analyzer in every year, or you want to. Here's why. You need to eat your own dog food. What does that mean? You have to take your own advice. 
You want your customers to call you spring and fall for maintenance. You have to take your own advice, send your device that's making you money in for a little bit of downtime, a little bit of love, and massage here and there. Okay. Cost per annual annual service is 290 for a two gas unit. Fastest service time out there, five days in season, which is now one to two days spring and summer. Fastest turnaround time. Fixed pricing, very easy to do. You can send it in to us directly. We'll give you an RMA number. You contact us, we'll give you an RMA. You package it up, you ship it to us. And then plus it's shipping, so you're going to pay for own shipping there and back. Um, or if you have a distributor that you work with, you can send it in to us through that distributor and they'll take care of that side of things for you. Okay. So, and then I don't care what anybody tells you, but any analyzers think they might do on the road calibrations. It's not a real calibration because they're not issuing you a calibration certificate when they do that. It has to be done in the lab. Yeah, All yeah, the calibration the certificates lab. also what's going to back you up in court. Is that an industry decided standard? Yeah. Yep. So exactly. Like when you get a speeding ticket, you go to the cop and say, well, the last yep. time you had that radar gun calibrated. Yep. And if it's not during the calibration during that time period, you walk, they don't take that, that you can't. If it's not within the calibration period, any statistical data provided off that electronic device cannot be submitted to court. That's why that's a perfect point that you made. The calibration certificate is a legal binding document. I know they have, like I told you, these ride along calibration things where people come and they do a bump test on it and they say it's calibrated. It is not. Calibration is done in the lab. The calibration certificate is issued. All the parameters are put on there for the sway and everything else. It's issued out. It's a legal binding document. We pay very large amounts of money for the insurance for our calibration lab. Because if one of them was to fail or one of the, the airlines didn't work right, we have to have insurance to back us up. So we take our calibrations very, very seriously. Okay. And if you're working on an oil system, make sure you do a smoke test first. Or I will find you and I will hunt you down. And I will say, why did you not? Why did you gunk up the analyzer? Gunk up. Yeah, gunk up. Just a little bit of information here. This was an old line that we had. A very, very effective line. Served us very, very well. Um, my mentor started the line, was very effective with it, passed it over to me. It did very well, but times have changed. This is the kind of reporting that we used to produce. Looked like a grocery store style receipt. Not very effective, didn't tell us much information, but it was the best that we had at the time. But that was one of the Achilles heels of the reporting. And that was one of the reasons why we designed things by text for text. And you're going to see some of the impact of that here in a second. But before we do, we were just taken on by NCI, National Conference Institute, the most elite training entity in the world for our industry. Not just in our country, but in the world. If you don't know who they are, or you should learn who they are, but probably most of you do. This is your truly with the godfather of combustion, Jim Davis. He is one of the smartest human beings that's ever walked the planet, along with him and Jim Bergman. Um, Jim Bergman, I think, is with, along with Jim Davis, I, I idolize the two of them. Um, it, I think that they're two of the most amazing human beings that God has ever placed here. Um, so I think they're wonderful. But Jim, um, Jim Davis works for Rock Red CI. They gave up a 10 year relationship with Bacharach. They were courted by all the other analyzer companies out there. They picked us out of all of them. And uh, it's been a very, very nice relationship. And it just started and it's going along swimmingly. So, what do we have here? Just some other things that we've got for the analyzer. So, the ones we're going to focus on primarily are these two right here. So, the 030 and the 130. This is residential light commercial. This is residential commercial. The both of these here give you a five year oxygen sensor. Any other analyzer you're using is giving you two. We're giving you five. They both have a four to five year CO sensor. Everybody else is two to three. Chances are it's two. You have no way of knowing in any other analyzer up until the present moment whether or not your sensor is going to fail on you tomorrow because all you can see is that it's working today. It could test fine today. You drive three hours for your job, say tomorrow it fails. That's an issue. We give you sensor life indicator on the screen. Tells you how much sensor life you have left. Then, if the sensor is going to fail, it'll show up on your screen. It'll tell you the sensor is going to fail. Roughly a 45 day notice to go ahead and replace said sensor. The oxygen sensor in here is still the replaceable pre calibrated. CO is not, it's the base model. Every sensor in this touchscreen suite on this 130 is filled replaceable pre calibrated. You can add NOx to this. You can add NOx or low NOx to this. Both of these have 8,000 ppm CO sensor with programmable pump cutoff. So as we talked about spiking CO sensors earlier, you're never going to spike your CO sensor ever again. That's just turning off automatically, by the way. 
It's not possessed. So you're never going to spike your show sensor again. It is set by the factory at 2,000 ppm. You can raise it up to 8,000. You can lower it. You can turn it off. I won't be your friend anymore if you do. <laughs> Put there to protect you. All kidding aside, you should keep it on. Okay. Some other things that we have is the reporting capability. Again, we talked about grocery store reports, right? Grocery store receipt reports no longer exist. We now have comprehensive reporting with the following. You can produce up to a three to ten page report with company logo, like Cleaver Brooks has here, on here, so you can customize it. You now have up to 60 readings per test, because you can set up to record every 10 seconds. You have up to eight job photos you can take from the job site, which you can have either take it from the app, because we have an app that controls the analyzer, so you can have to see everything in real time, or you can take the photos from your camera roll. You have a section for technician notes that you've never had before. Half the size of a piece of notebook paper. You can put all the notes for that job site, what you recommend to the customer if they decline a repair. And there's a signature section for both you and the customer to sign off on the report. So if they decline a repair, they're signing off on the fact that they decline it if it's in the notes. Okay. Also, pull the equipment database with all the models and serial numbers for that customer, tagged by customer, and you can have each customer in there with all their addresses and all their locations. So, for example, you do a lot of work for Chick fil A. They have 30 locations in a, in a two-state area. You can have all the locations listed and all the models and serial numbers tagged per location. Then you can create a combustion database. Very, very simple. Create yourself a SharePoint file, alphabetical by customer name. As you do a combustion report, it's a PDF. You send it to somebody in your office. They click and drag the PDF, put it in an alphabetical folder named by that customer's name. So the next time either you or another technician goes out there, click and drag down the PDF. You can see all the combustion information that was just done. Very, very simple. Okay, very simple. So we have those features. Oh, yeah. Also, firmware updates are done right. over the app. So anytime it's a firmware update, it's done right over the app. You don't have to send it in to me to do it. You do it over the app, or you can do it over if you get the 130, which is the touchscreen model here. You're that one or that one. You can do it over the PC software. Okay. So as we make enhancements, you get those enhancements for free. For example, when we first launched. We only have four photos. We now have eight. We did not have the signature sections. Now we do. We did not have separate tests for gas pressure and draft. Now we do. Okay. So that's what photos look like. Okay. <clears throat> These are, oops. Let me back up here for a second. Oh, no, actually, I'll keep it right here. So we have, <laughs> this is what the data reporting looks like on the analyzer. This you can map different parameters. So this is what it looks like. So you get full remote control of the analyzer through your phone or tablet. So very, very handy. You can generate reports, save data points, and the like. So you can be up to 100 feet away or more from the analyzer while you're doing a test on the phone with tech support, emailing them readings right in real time, saying, I don't understand what's, what's going on here, trying to repair this, any tips from you. They can see your email report. They can see all your combustion data because it's going to be very, very helpful that you actually have combustion data to give them. Okay? We have different accessories. So we have printers, smart air temperature probes, like I talked about, manometer hose kits, all other kinds of things here. Yeah. And again, just a litany of the stuff here. I'm going to go over one more thing here. We're running a special right now, which actually ends November 30th. So if anybody wanted to get the touchscreen model here on the right, you're going to get a free manometer that we have, digital manometer, that has an app attached to it as well. Free Salmon Brennan headlight. You get the 030, got an infrared gun, and also a telescoping magnetic flashlight. Both of these two handhelds here, though, come attached to an app that is very effective. So you can even, even off a simple device like that, generate reports, okay? So a very, very important little promo that we're running that we decided to extend because it's been extremely popular. Um, and we have a YouTube channel. YouTube videos are on there. I've been on the HVAC Shop Talk podcast with Zach Ciotta a couple of times. I think it might be a link on, or two on there for that. We have how-to videos on the website. And my little blonde bombshell, the dog wants to know if you have I tend to be rather in depth. Um, so, um, question, I, I understand it, but uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I greatly appreciate it. Again, credentials here, contact information is there, and I all have my card. And with that, I have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Tyler, we'd like to.
hand off a little something to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate thank it very you. much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's an honor and a pleasure. So thank you very much. Anyway. Hopefully you guys learned something. Area 50. Yes. Very cool. Oh. I saw that one. I think when it was first posted to her, I saw it somewhere. I saw the, the image. I'm like, that is really neat. 